Our gospel reading today comes in the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes, His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all nations, and He will separate people one from another, as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or and feed you, thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when do we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. There is a movement afoot in our society today and has been for several years. A movement that says uh, there's a lot of seminary professors and a lot of scholars and theologians that say there is no devil and there is no hell. There are some uh, social activists who would say that Jesus' message was all about peace and tolerance and love. Well, casting somebody into an eternal hell doesn't sound like he was very tolerant towards sin to me. You see, this has been a movement afoot since the Enlightenment period of our time. And to, at the risk of being a, a conspiracy theorist, in the 1950s, after World War II and the fall of communism, the Communist Party of the United States wrote a manifesto. And they had particular goals in this manifesto. Goal number one was to bring about communism in the United States they had to first bring about socialism. To bring about socialism, they have to have big government, a nanny state. Therefore, they must destroy the human, the, the main element that makes up America so that they can legitimize bringing in government to take over. What is the main element that makes up America? The family unit. So their goals were thus. Don't take my word for it. Google it. Communist Manifesto of 1950. Number one, destroy the family unit by promoting homosexuality as an as a alternative lifestyle. Number two, promote cohabitation instead of marriage to destroy the family unit. Number three, to take over the schools and make this a nanny state where the parents were no longer responsible for the education of the children, but the government was thus indoctrinating the children. Number four, destroy the credibility of scripture because scripture is a stumbling block. How are they doing? How are they doing today, guys? They later called themselves socialists. They later call themselves today progressives. Their goal is to completely destroy and demolish any morality in our society today so that it can be run by government because the utopia, the utopia that they create is well worth it. What's next? Pedophilia. It'll be legalized. It's already going on in England. They're already working to legalize it. They will destroy the family unit. How are they just trying to destroy Scripture? Well, that's, that's what Jesus said. That's not what he really meant. Why are they getting away with convincing people that there is no devil and there is no hell? Why are they getting away with convincing people that Jesus was simply a social activist, a rebel, to bring about reform in society and culture? 
Because you don't know what's in here. And they are lying to you about what's in here. And because our society is one of the most biblically illiterate societies in the history of the world, they are able to advance this agenda in our country. Because you don't know the scriptures. Read your Bibles. Get to know them. Know what's in here. Because as today's reading says, Jesus Christ is coming back. And there will be a place for those who are not of His will. And that place, folks, 41, uh, verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the angels. 46, And they will go into eternal punishment. Do you know what in Greek the phrase that they use here, the same word they use here means eternal? It means forever. Not that you get a second chance. Not for a little while. Not that you cease to exist. It means you will be in hell and be punished forever. Non-stopping. Forever. It is clear from Scripture that there is a hell that people will go to and be punished forever. And yet they lie to you. A society as a whole, not use books in general. They lie to our society as a whole to push the social agenda. They've taken over the mainline denominations. They've taken over the government. They've taken over the colleges. And now they're taking over the seminaries. Wake up. It's time to stand and fight and confess. In our Lutheran faith, we have a time that when our basic Christian doctrines are threatened, we have something we can do. It's called invoking a state of confession. doesn't mean confess your sins. It means confess your faith. Stand and confess your faith. If you need permission to stand on your faith, then you now have it. Understand that a lot of what I preach from this pulpit it gives us, it puts us in danger of living under our 501c3 status. It, it puts me in the danger of losing my job. But it's the truth. And I'll stand and scream the truth. I will not stop and let this world go to hell because I have three children that will grow up in this world and I will not let them be a part of this demoralization. I will not let them be the goats on the left. I will give everything to keep them from it. And I know that I can do that and be successful at it because you folks stand with me. And we'll stand together and we'll confess our faith. The king will say to those on the right, right and left, they're significant in history, in this culture. There wasn't a whole lot of soap, there wasn't a whole lot of water. You wiped yourself with your left hand, you ate with your right, you didn't want to mix up the two. You get what I'm saying? Okay. You blessed with your right hand, you dug in the dirt with your left, you picked your nose with your left, whatever. Left is the dirty, evil side, right is the holy side. If you ever see Jesus in a scripture, in a picture, understand art is not a historical representation all the time. Pictures of Jesus, he's blessing with his right hand. It's not a historical interpretation. It's a uh, a significant symbolism that the right is the is the is the good side, the blessed side for the Jews. He blesses like this: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Get it? Three fingers. He's blessing with his right hand. You bless with your right hand. You know, when I do the side of the cross to you. It's my right hand. Right's the good side. Left is the evil side. So. When Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, obviously the good ones go to the right, the bad ones go to the left. Where is Jesus seated? Right hand of the Father. Gotcha. Significance. So if we read just Matthew 25 today, it would seem that just being a good person would get us into heaven, as the progressives tell us. Yeah, just feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Visit the sick and poor. You get into heaven. Doesn't have very little to do with faith in Jesus, does it? However, we don't have just Matthew 25. We have the entire scriptures. That witnesses to Abraham being counted righteous before God on account of his faith. Before any covenant was made, before any symbol was made. Genesis 19, 17, 19, 17, 15. And Abraham believed him and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Paul in Romans points back to that's when salvation by faith 
from the very beginning. Faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by the Father. Why are they blessed by the Father? Have they talked about their works yet? They're blessed by the Father because these are the ones He has given faith to. These are the ones He's given the gift of salvation to. That's why they are blessed by the Father. Before they do any good works, they first have to have faith. Their faith given to them at their baptism or hearing the words of a preacher. Enter the kingdom prepared to you prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Ephesians tells us God has chosen you. Your name is written in the book of life. Revelation tells us before the world is even created, before you even had a chance to do any good work, God chose you to give you faith. Before the foundation of the world, God created heaven for you. You, the believers. So what are these good works they do? They're the fruit of faith, not actions they do to gain faith. As a matter of fact, if they knew they were doing these good works, what would they most likely do, Paul tells us? They'd boast in them. That's right, Jesus. You let me in. I did all this good stuff. I did it. Martin Luther said, and it's the most profound, one of the most profound statements he said that I really cling to, a truly good work is one you do and don't even realize that you've done. At least you boast in it. God uses his called and faithful to further his mission on earth most times without them even knowing it. These people are not taking pride in their works. They're not looking around going, look how faithful we are, we get in. They're quite the opposite. They're looking around going, Jesus, that's great. Hey, we're coming, but when did we do this? They didn't even know God was using them. At least their human pride rise up and they put their faith and trust in their own abilities and not Jesus Christ. That's what Rebaptism is all about denying your chosen status by God and putting your faith and trust in your own choice. Well, if you want to put your faith and trust in your own choice, good luck to you. I'm going to claim with what Jesus declared me to be. These people are righteous not because of their choices, they're righteous because Jesus Christ declared them righteous on account of his work, not theirs. Cling to the promise of Jesus Christ. Don't go back under the law. We're free from the law. Flee from the law. Cling to the promise of Jesus. Cling to your Savior. It's the only way in. Believe me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. A lot of this stuff we can understand. You know, I was thirsty, hungry. You gave me something to drink. If you've been coming to our Tuesday night services, you know that there weren't a lot of Super 8 motels and not a lot of McDonald's and Wendy's and Hardee's in, in the first century or in the biblical times. So when people traveled, they couldn't just swing through McDonald's and grab a cheeseburger as they went through town, okay? They had to rely upon the kindness and the generosity of strangers. As well in the first century as it was in the beginning. So... What Jesus is saying is when you were a stranger, I was coming through town, you welcomed me in, you fed me, you gave me clothes, you gave me something to drink. This is very common in this time. Not everybody would do this. But we can understand it in our context today. We feed the hungry. We give people something to drink if they're thirsty. We collect clothes for those who have lost it. When I'm sick, you visited me. We go visit the sick. What do we do when we visit the sick? We bring them the promise of Jesus Christ. We bring them prayer, salvation. We bring them comfort. But there's something very significant in I was in prison, you came to visit me. Now, in our context today, we would first think that there are a ton of prison ministries. There's a ton of criminals who are in prison. And we should go visit them. They need Jesus more than anybody. That's right. However, this 
and its cultural context. And Jesus' original meaning was not criminals who were in prison. Who was reading the Gospel of Matthew? First century Christians. Where were they? Being persecuted in prison for their beliefs. What Jesus is saying was, those he's foretelling of the martyrdom to come. He's foretelling of the first century Christians, when they're locked up in prison, they're going to need your support. Why? In a Roman prison, in a Roman prison, do you know how many blankets they give you? Zero. You know how many meals they fed you in a Roman prison? Nada. If you didn't have family and friends and people outside to feed you and clothe you while you were in prison, you rotted and died in prison. This is significant. It's not only people who are in prison. It's those who are imprisoned because of their faith that we are to love and support. Now, that's in Jesus' first century context. It was a physical imprisonment. However, today, and I'm not uh, preaching against prison ministries. They're fantastic. Still do them. I'm saying it goes beyond that. We went to uh, Des Moines yesterday, Russ and Missy and Zanny and I, and we listened to the six presidential candidates. Uh, Huntsman and, and Romney weren't there. The two Mormons didn't show up. At First Century, or uh, First Federated Church, 3,000, 3,100 people showed up, 3,100 Christians. And these six candidates were set around a table and asked specifically questions of faith. What do you believe and understand about Jesus Christ? All six of them. It's fantastic. And Bachman said something that, and again, I'm not endorsing or supporting any particular candidate. She just told me a story that made me think about being in prison in our world today. She led the charge for traditional marriage in Minnesota to preserve it after Massachusetts went and voted for homosexual marriage. Sodomy, by the way, sodomy is an abomination according to God. It's filth. Whether it's homosexual or heterosexual, sodomy, filth. Destroys societies. She led the charge to preserve traditional marriage. They had five natural children and 23 foster children. They had to hide their children in small communities outside of the city because of all the death threats from the social activists because they were leading a charge, successfully I might add, against the social decline of morality. They were going to kill her children to try to silence her for standing on her faith. They were imprisoned away from society, shunned from society. These are the times, not just politicians, but anybody in general who's been shunned or imprisoned on account of their faith. In America, or, you know, go on to Voice of the Martyrs. There's millions of them worldwide. These are the people we need to clothe and care for and love. Although in the United States, people don't go hungry and unclothed in our prisons. They certainly do overseas. There are a ton of people who are imprisoned by social exile or physical imprisonment for standing on their faith. These are people that we need to support in prayer, in encouragement, and with their physical needs. Because these are the people who are going to make a difference for our children and not let society decline and, and, and just be destroyed. Also, there are nursing homes and retirement communities in our society today. And they are prisons. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying if you send grandma or grandpa off to a nursing home, you're throwing them in jail, okay? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, because of no fault of their own, through lack of either finances or physical ability, they are no longer able to care for themselves. They are no longer free to roam about the community, driving cars. They can't run to the grocery store and grab a loaf of bread. They can't bathe themselves sometimes. They have lost their freedom due to their physical inabilities. When I go to nursing homes, I do not stand there and tell them, well done, good and faithful servant, enjoy the rest of your life. They are still a part of the Matthew 25 commission to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, preaching and teaching all that I've commanded and baptizing. 
The, are you kidding me? My, my generation? Cody, your generation? Do we need their common sense morality? Do we need their traditional values? Holy cow, more than ever. We need their sense. We need their life experience. We need their faith. People that are in nursing homes now never would have questioned whether the miracles of Jesus really happened or whether Jesus was actually resurrected. They never would have questioned the authority of Scripture. We need them. They are our preachers. They are our rock-solid foundation. And I tell them, how many people do you encounter a day? Does your daughter call? Probably doesn't come visit, daughter or son. Most of them don't get a lot of visitors. Do they call? Well, there you go. It's your chance to preach. How many nurses or nurses' aides come in and out of your room a day? Have you ever stopped to ask them how their day's going and how their family is? You have the chance to preach to thousands of people if you just open your eyes and look. And by the way, you know who's sick in the community and who's not. You have the words of comfort on your tongue, written on your heart by Jesus Christ. You can bring comfort to the dying in these nursing homes. You can bring the good news. You're not done yet. However, we have, as a society, because we're so busy, and we are, we're busy. I mean, let's not be condemning or just too busy. Let's just be realistic. We're busy. we got a lot going on. We have not gone in there and properly fed them with the scriptures, fed them with communion, built them up, and give them the tools they need and the encouragement they need to continue preaching to all of those around them. This is what we need to do. Now, I'm willing to guess that there's a few of you in here who don't know somebody in a nursing home. I would bet any amount of money that if you walked into a nursing home and went to the administrator's office or the nurse's station and said, hey, who in here doesn't receive a whole lot of visitors? I bet they'd have a name for you. And now the courageousness and the power and the authority of the gospel, you could go in and say, Hi, I'm Jamie Strickler. Can I visit with you today? What are they going to say? No, get out of here. They're going to be like, Hey, I haven't had a visitor in years. Sit down. Tell me about your life. Tell me about yourself. It's not a sole source of ministry, but it's a source we're lacking. These are the people in prison in our society today due to physical disabilities. It's a necessity. Nursing homes are a necessity. There's, there's no way around it. They're not an evil place. They're, they're, a, oh, they're a gift from God when we don't have time to care for our, our failing and elders, that somebody's there to care for them. But it's a ministry nonetheless that we should not neglect. These people <laughs> can tell us what it was like in the world where you don't turn on the TV and go to MTV and watch a show where uh, one guy lines up 30 girls and he sleeps with all of them several times and he picks one at the end of the deal. I mean, come on, you guys. These people can tell us what it was like. Whoopi Goldberg said, it's over, we're not going back, live with it. Well, I'm sorry, Whoopi, if I don't take my moral and scriptural advice from you. Whoopi! Yeah. Called and ordained Whoopi. Hmm. Whatever. So, there's a hell. There is a hell. People are going to go there. Good news is you're not. Because Christ has claimed you as his own. He has called you to be righteous. You are children of God. You will do good works for the Lord, whether you know it or not. Because he will change your heart, and he will give you the desire to do so. You will not hear the words, the final words of our psalm today. Anybody remember them? I put them back in there so that we could hear them, because they weren't in the lectionary. Because of my wrath... They will never enter my rest. You'll not hear those words. Because you're not going to encounter a God of wrath. You've got Jesus Christ, the Savior, our Lord. And through Jesus Christ, God is a God of love and forgiveness. On account of Christ's righteousness. Outside of Jesus Christ, His word. You can take your chances under the law. 
Now, is this fair? Who is God to say, you know, well, I gave you faith, so now you can come in, and I didn't give you faith, so now you're going to hell. Well, let me ask you this. If I go to a court of law because I didn't wear my seatbelt, which I don't anymore because my van goes boom, boom, boom. The kids and I call it the buckle up fathead bong. <laughs> if I go to court because I didn't buckle my seatbelt and I go before the judge and say, well, I didn't know, or I didn't read that, or, or it's uncomfortable. Don't, don't infringe on my personhood. I'm an individual, man. I don't want to wear my seatbelt. It's not cool. You know? Who are you to judge me for not wearing my seatbelt? Huh? Do you think that judge is going to let me off? Because when you break the law, you break the law. I've dealt with men, uh, I've gone to court with folks that have had OWIs in our society. And I, I want to hear all their stories. Woom, 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 woom. The cop was mean to me. Woom, woom, woom. It's not fair. Woom, woom, woom. I only had two beers. Woom, woom, woom. Did you blow into that little instrument? Yes. Were you legally drunk? Yes. End of story. Deal with it. You broke the law. There's no justification. There's no talking your way out of it. The law is the law. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ that we are not judged by the law, that we get salvation by faith because none of us would make it. So if I go before this judge and I give him my sob story, who are you to infringe on my individualism? Well, you know what? I don't believe in what your law says. Nah. Well, your law says wear your seatbelt, but it really meant unless you were born with an adherence to wearing seatbelts. See, I was born without the desire to wear a seatbelt. Therefore, I can break the law and I'm good to go. None of these are valid reasons for breaking the law. And none of these will get you off in the final judgment. Not a one. However, there's a difference. God calls some to his right and he says... I'm going to pay your fine for you. And I'm going to restore you to righteousness. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay for what you've done and restore you to righteousness. The ones on the left, is that unfair to them? Is it God's money? Does he not have the right who he gives, pays for and who he doesn't? But if you don't believe in an all-powerful creator and an all-sovereign creator, then you can question the judgment of God. You can question the judgment of God and you can question the authority of Scripture and you can question it all the way to hell. That's where it's going to get you. But you folks will not hear. You will not hear because of my wrath, they didn't enter my rest. You will hear, you blessed of the Father, enter the place that I've prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Now I ask you, did God prepare hell for wicked people? It's not what the scripture says, is it? He says he will throw people into the eternal fire that was prepared for Satan and his angels. God prepared hell for Satan and his angels. And because of the fall of man, now that's where mankind go. But you will not hear that. You will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, man, to hear that. No matter what trial I have in my life, no matter what hell I face, no matter what problem I have, no matter what hospital bill comes in the mail, you know, no matter what, when I get to heaven, if Jesus Christ hugs me, and whispers in my ear, well done, good and faithful servant. It'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it. That's all I want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I'll ask him, as these people did, what possibly could I have done that was good?
you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You are the people of God. You are the faithful. All I'm asking you today is when you walk out that door, act like it. That's it. Act like it. Don't backbite. Don't cause your brothers and sisters to stumble. Don't cause turmoil in your faith community. Don't cause turmoil at work. Don't get jealous of another Christian. Don't become emotionally unavailable to your wife and kids. Don't think that jobs or sporting events are more important than taking time to sit and visit with your children and visit with your spouse. Don't think that whatever new polling news on Fox News or CNN or whatever you watch is far more important than listening to your wife's day, how it went. Act like it. Pour yourself out for another. I'm going to go and continue to be the mouthpiece because that's the talent and position God's given me. And the reason I can go and do it is because you people stand behind me. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I'd be crushed. If I didn't have somebody to cry to, Russ, they hurt my feelings again. <laughs> you know? Doc, they're picking on me. I mean, don't think these guys don't get phone calls. They do all the time. You know, they're like, this guy? Come on, seriously? <laughs> you know. You people stand behind me. We're going to stand together. We're going to feed the hungry. We're going to clothe the naked. We're going to love and serve the people of this world whether they deserve it or not. We're going to do it all for the glory of God. We're going to do it all for that promise of well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunities and the ideas and the, the intelligence and the willingness of the people that stand before me. The, 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 the ways in which we can love and serve your people. We thank you, God, for all of that. We know, Lord, says that in the end, all nation, believer or not, will bend a knee. Will be bent a knee before you and declare that you are Lord. Lord, we just ask that you protect our children. You protect those that we love and care about. That you use us as beacon of lights, as examples to stand on your firm authority of your scripture. Father, Jesus Christ, your Son, is the Word of God. And to deny your Word, Lord, is to deny our Savior, and there's no hope. So, Father, we stand on your Word, as unpopular as it may make us, but we do it all for your glory and for your will, because we know that there's not thing one that we can do on our own. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.